Okay, perfect. And uh, and Anne, you're still with us. Uh, a lot of what you said is extremely relevant to what I'm going to share now. So um, I think it's a really nice segue. So uh, my name is Roisin Eginton. For those of you I haven't met before, I'm a program manager in the National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate, and my remit is mostly around quality improvement. So I've been delighted to be working with the Hospice Friendly Hospital team for some time now uh, in regards to the QI awards and also some general capacity building on quality improvement. So the focus of today is um, on measuring improvements in end-of-life care in our QI work. Uh, now. So again, I'm not going to go through a big um, spiel on quality improvement, and we do. I do have signposts to resources after this if you'd like to learn more. But basically, quality improvement is a systematic and coordinated approach to solving a problem using specific methods and tools, um, with the aim of bringing about a measurable improvement. And the key word in that is measurable. Um, Things might look like an improvement, you might think they're improvement, but unless you have data like Anne showed there, or unless you have qualitative or quantitative data, you have no way of actually showing that it has been a measurable improvement. Now, the difference between QI and projects, traditional projects, is quality improvement is best placed for problems or opportunities that don't have a defined solution, where you may not know exactly how you're going to reach your aim and you want to test a couple of different approaches so as Anne and Vivian explained they had their end of life care study day and they also had the badges so actually they can be split out into two different PDSA cycles they're both tests of change to see what had a measurable impact and what may not have and there's learning in all of that Quality improvement is based on, it's a framework really that we use uh, to drive continuous quality improvement. This is the model for improvement, it's called. And it was adopted by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the US a number of years ago. It's essentially a method for structuring an improvement project and developing and testing those ideas. So the model consists of two parts. The first are the three questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know changes in improvement? So that's the measurement piece. And what changes can we make will result in improvement? And that's followed by PDSA cycles. So that's plan, do, study, and act. And they outline the steps for the actual testing of the change ideas. And Anne and Vivian sh shared one of their PDSA cycles. The cyclical nature allows the change to be refined and improved through repeated cycles. And that gives you that vehicle for continuous improvement. So again, today we're gonna to focus on that second question in the model for improvement, which is how will I know that a change has resulted in improvement and how can we measure and monitor our quality improvement projects? One of the key things we say is, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Because if you don't know where you've been in terms of the baseline or, or where you've been in terms of your problem, you don't know where you want to go to. So going back again, we're, we're looking at this second question today, how do we know that change is an improvement? And as, as W. Edwards Deming, who's considered one of the, the fathers, founding fathers of the quality improvement movement has said, um, without your data, you're just another person with an opinion. You might have a hunch, you might have a feeling, you might have an idea, but you need that data to support the, um, the, the fact that your change idea has resulted in improvement or indeed disimprovement. When we start talking about data and measurement, we get a lot of reactions. Some people are really excited. Some people love a good Excel sheet, um, or if anybody remembers access from back in the day, um, anything with spreadsheets and numbers can cause great happiness. Some people are a bit apathetic when it comes to data. Some people are downright bored by it. Some people are a little nervous. This, Lucy, this is a little bit like your icebreaker you shared earlier. This is like all the dogs. And, and then some people, when they hear the word data, they literally want to run out of the room. So when quality improvement, I think one of the most important things we can say is you do not need to be an expert in measurement to measure improvement. You do not need to know complex analytical methods or statistics or anything that requires a years of experience or indeed a qualification. The important thing about quality improvement is you're collecting just enough data to show that your test of change has resulted in improvement. Sorry, Lucy, I'm just leaving my video off because I have some network problems while I'm sharing. Apologies. I'll be able to put my, my video no back. On if I, I thought that would be the case. No yeah. problem at all. Sorry. Um, we have some network issues. I'm also here in Galway, but I'm a bit more out in the countryside. 
Um, so we collect just enough data to show whether a change has resulted in improvement. And the important thing there is quality improvement is not research. You're not trying to collect every bit of data that you can collect on a topic. You can publish quality improvement learnings. You can certainly make posters, enter them in uh, competitions or bring them to forums or conferences. But quality improvement is not research. It's not generalizable research necessarily. You can combine the two, but you don't have to collect loads and reams of data to support your hypotheses. This is about collecting just enough information to show that what you've done has created an improvement. And again, Anne showed you that fantastic questionnaire, 12 questions used by Mentimeter before and after. It didn't have to be a 50 question questionnaire. It didn't have to be a deeper understanding of everything people know about end of life care. It was just to understand whether the study day and whether the badges had an impact. That's all you need to know. I think it's a really important point around QI. So as Anne also showed you, they had three different types of measures. These are the types of measures we cover in quality improvement. The first are outcome measures. So that's the data that shows you, you have achieved your aim. You have either um, improved knowledge, you've improved skills, you've made an impact on patients or their families. That is really, you've achieved the aim of your quality improvement project. The process measures, measures look at the different components of the system that affect the outcome. So the process measures ask, is the process improving? Is the process reliable? There are the bits you're working on to achieve the overall aim. And then finally, your balancing measures. And Anne and Vivian had a really, really good one there. The balancing measures cross-check the consequences of the change on the system, both positive and negative. So the balancing measure tells you whether what you've put in place has had a knock-on effect elsewhere. And we really don't look at balancing measures enough in the health service in general. So what the balancing measures say is by putting in, by having the study day, for example, has that had an impact on people's time? You know, they had to take a whole day out of their work. Was it worthwhile? And um, other things you can look at is if you're introducing a new process that has more tasks involved with it, people only have a finite amount of time. So by putting the time into a new process, are they taking away from time elsewhere? Or is the new process so worthwhile that it might actually be freeing up their process on the other side of things, if that makes sense? To give you some examples from a QI project that was used in end of life care service in the UK, they set up a virtual memory wall for families to share a photo or a memory or special thought of their loved one. And it was a real way to tangibly share about their loved one that had passed within the hospital. One of the outcome measures they chose was measuring the experience of the family and friends in using the wall. What was their feedback on using the wall? How did it make them feel? The process measure was the percentage of ward staff who were aware of the virtual war, wall and the number of posts on the wall per week. So they were able to track how many posts were put up on the wall every week and track that over time, see if it was increasing, decreasing, what might have been impacting on it. And that final bit, the balancing measure was, has maintaining the wall put an additional administrative burden on an individual or team? So when you set up that wall, you have to keep it going. Is it really sustainable is the question and somebody has to monitor it. It's not going to be, it's not going to just continue on its own. You need to have somebody keeping an eye on it or monitoring or letting people know about it. And has the extra time it took to maintain it been worthwhile? And has it taken away time from other, other tasks? Data for measuring improvement end of life care. When you're looking for data that you want to measure, first place you should always go to is existing data sources. Um, or existing measurement sources or tools that might be out there. Work with what you have before you create something new. So again, there might be organizational measures like the National End of Life Survey. And these are also really good inspiration for QI projects because I think there was one or two people that mentioned they still don't know what they want to do a QI project on or an area they want to apply for. Look at the results of the National End of Life Care Survey. You can look at clinical instruments. Now, they might, there might be some that are used in your service, but there are also some that are used internationally. So there's quality of death and dying surveys that have been used around the world. But even here in Ireland, the nursing quality care metrics, um, there is one metric relating to end-of-life care. And if you can look at that, it might give you some inspiration from where a project could take place, but it's also a measure that's already being collected that you can look at and you can gather that data without introducing a whole new process on data measurement. 
audits. So there might already be audits in your hospital and um, audits against the quality standards. There might be even clinical audits um, that you can tap into that might be dealing with end of life care. Compliments and complaints are always a really good one. And if your hospital has a quality display board, that's another place that you can either track your measurements or there might be some data already gathered on there that you can already use. So those are existing data sources you can tap into. But you might also wanna look at new data sources. And in end of life care, we find, and this is just anecdotally, I've done a lot of reading on this. Um, it can be more difficult to get quantitative data um, and it seems that qualitative data is the more holistic way to go in terms of measuring the impact of quality improvements. So some of those qualitative ones um, that we focus on are surveys and questionnaires. And again, you'd want to be very conscious, and you already know this, and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you your work, you already know this well enough, but if the nuances of end-of-life care are very different to, to other care pathways in the hospital. So you'd want to, for example, with a survey or a focus group, you'd want to paste the questions to the subject's mood and energy levels. You'd want to consider open-ended questions that might need to be specifically tailored to someone's level of knowledge. And if you're, you're delivering the survey or a focus group with patients or family members, obviously you don't want to cause any more distress so you just want to be very careful with how you do them. But there's fantastic examples out there. Observations is another way that's a bit more, um, it's a step away from a direct involvement with patients and families. And that is, for example, you could have a clipboard and you could observe the interactions between patients and family members and healthcare staff. And those observations, just as a third party observing the nature of their interaction, can tell you a lot and you can track those observations over time. Patient stories are a fantastic source of data. So again, you can have those patient stories saying how a new intervention impacted on their lives. So again, I'm thinking of, for example, the, the sleepover chairs that have been brought into a number of the hospitals. If you can have a patient story or indeed a family story of how that chair impacted on their stay in the hospital and impacted on the amount of time the family member could stay with them in hospital and have that captured as a video or have it written down as prose. You could even ask people to do mood boards. There's so many different ways that you can capture those patient stories. Walk in their footsteps. So this was done um, by a number of end-of-life care projects in the UK, quality improvement projects, where they walked the walk and Anne and Vivian explained how they asked people to visit the mortuary. So you can see what patients and family, well, and particularly with the mortuary, family members, unfortunately, see what they see, walk in their footsteps, what's on the walls, what type of lighting is there, what do they see at some of the most distressing times in their lives. Shadowing is an interesting one. Um, shadowing is actually walking with the patient or family member. And this, I know there's, there has been some reluctance to do this. People say this is quite an emotive and um, a difficult time in people's lives. Do you actually want a healthcare professional sitting next to them the whole time? But it's been proved to be hugely effective. Um, and actually, it's, it's like an unstated support system for the patient to have somebody with them all the time. And there's a number of ways people have shadowed. So you could either do it that you're just um, sitting with them as a silent support, silently kind of observing uh, their interactions during the day. They could do it as a, a friend nearly. So you're sitting, you might be chatting with them during the course of the day. Um, and there is a lot of engagement around that from an ethical perspective with chatting with the, the families as well. Um, or indeed, if you're shadowing a family member, having a good discussion with them as to why you're doing it. But we do have examples of that we can share with you. And then finally, alternative methods of feedback. So some hospitals have Facebook pages, LinkedIn pages. Um, some people share on social media like X. And there are some fantastic examples of feedback there, particularly from people who wouldn't feel as empowered to use the compliments and complaints process, or they might be a bit nervous about going down that route. So don't be afraid to use alternative methods of gathering feedback or looking at feedback uh, for inspiration for your QI projects. 
We have a number of additional resources I just wanted to show you. We have e-learning modules on HSC land, a 30 minute, a three hour one, self-paced, so you don't have to do it all at once, don't be nervous. Um, and working as a team for improvement is 30 minutes. And we have a number of YouTube videos there that we can, we're can. we happy to send this out to you with the links to them that'll engage you on you know, using different quality improvement approaches and methods. And even that last one, how to create a run chart is how to take your data and, and plot it on a, a chart to show the changes over time, like Anne and Vivian did on their chart there. We have a new guiding toolkit that's coming out this week. Uh, we're very excited about it. And it's, it's really taking you from that light bulb moment of having your first QI idea to how you can progress through a QI project, ultimately to sustaining and spreading it. And we have lots of really engaging tools in it. And um, so you can follow us on social media and we'll also be sharing it with Lucy. So she'll be, she'll be able to share it with you. Um, I'd say it'll be tomorrow that we should get it out there, which is pretty exciting. And then finally, we have the Q community. Q is a community of over 5,000 people across the UK and Ireland. Membership is free. And there are some special interest groups in Q around end of life care and palliative care and people working in those areas. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a resource across the UK and Ireland of people working to improve the quality of health and social care. Um, we have our first in-person event scheduled for November. We have a number of networking events throughout the year. So we'd love if you were interested more in QI, if you might apply to join Q. Like I said, it's free membership and it is a wealth of resources. So I know we're going to open the floor to any questions, but my last slide here, and Lucy will share the slide set with you. If you have any questions after this on quality improvement and even on measuring your QI projects, please don't be afraid to reach out and, and I can send you on some resources. I'll be happy to, to have a quick call with you and might be, be able to point you in the right direction.